Hello? Hello? Still there, no? This is here. Okay. I guess. Hello? This man, even though I see you all the time, I can still greet you. Okay. Fantastic. Good morning, everybody, and um, a warm welcome to the sixth World Bank Africa Investor Strategic Dialogue. Um, today we're going to be discussing supporting the creation of large uh, African firms as our theme. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, an elite and distinguished uh, group of panelists, and there will be others joining um, over the next sort of 30 minutes. Um, but today we're really going to look at uh, an issue that you hear on the conference circuit, you hear within the development community, and increasingly it's become an, an area of expertise that the private sector leaders have, have really thought about how do we support the growth of a local private sector. So to address a number of these issues, I'm, I'm joined by Jean-Philippe Prosper uh, to my left, the Vice President um, of Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean at the IFC. Uh, a brief round of applause, please. Let's get, let's get warm. <laughs> okay. Um, I have the uh, Honourable Minister um, Sidi Uta uh, to my right, who is the Minister for Economic Affairs and Development of Mauritania. I have the Honourable Amadou um, Boubacar Sisse, the Minister of State for Planning, Regional Development and Community, um, and, and Community Development of Niger. Thank you. Um, and we're going to be joined by the Honourable Ministers of Finance from Kenya, um, and Uganda, um, but towards the end of the panel, we have the uh, Admasu Tadesi, who is the president and CEO of PTA Bank. We have Ms. Villa Kulilild, who is the director general of NORAD. I hope I didn't butcher your name too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually the African names that, it, that, that the Europeans would butcher. Anyway, <laughs> um, and we have uh, Dorote Sosa, who is the permanent secretary of OHADA. Uh, so, Super, we're going to get, jump straight into this, and Jean-Philippe, I'm going to call on you now, please, to really set the scene. IFC is doing some great stuff in terms of supporting and developing and, and assisting companies uh, move across the continent and grow. So, over to you. All right. Thank you, Herbert, uh, for that introduction. Uh, and thanks to our host for organizing this event today. I am pleased to kick off this panel and share the stage with my other distinguished panelists. The topic of creating large African firms is an important and timely one. Today, Africa is turning heads around the world. African economies represent a significant achievement of sound policies and improving governance. Yes, there are a number of issues you hear. You can hear here and there a few countries in trouble. But for whatever reason, when you have a few countries, people from outside tend to believe that's the whole continent. We have the data, and we are happy to tell you that actually this is the minority, but the majority are making reforms and improving. The continent today is reaping great dividends from these circumstances I just mentioned, and this is improving people's lives. The value of the changes we see in Africa today is not a theoretical concept to us at the IFC. The improving investment climate in Africa has had a direct impact on our willingness and capacity to grow dramatically in the Africa region. And we know that this has led other sustainable investors to pay more attention to Africa. Indeed, most of the other, if I just to mention uh, some of the development finance institutions, most of them have been growing their business in Africa. Um, IFC on its own, on its part, 
posted record results for fiscal year 2013. Our fiscal year usually ends June, I mean, not usually ends on June the 30th. So the last fiscal year, we had $5.3 billion worth of new investment in sub-Saharan Africa. And this in about 30, in 30 plus countries. So again, when people are saying that Africa is in trouble, well, we have them busy in more than 30 countries. Um, when I began working in Africa in about 2004, we invested less IFC, I mean, less than $200 million annually. So <laughs> we are not alone in our optimism about Africa. Of that $5.3 billion, $1.5 billion was mobilized from others. And we know that others followed our interest. Uh, indeed, in, uh, I mentioned in uh, 34 countries that we invested, it was in more than 130 projects. And we brought others in many of those. We expanded also our advisory services. Africa today, as a region, is the largest in terms of advisory services for IFC. We had $65 million we invested in advisory services. And in terms of investment, we went from the last region to become, to be today, the second largest region. We are only second to Latin America, where last year we invested $6.5 billion, and Africa was the second before Asia or Eastern Europe, or Middle East, North Africa, or Eastern Europe, and others. Through these investments and advisory, we are able to support infrastructure, agribusiness, health, a range of activities in conflict affected states. We also helped African entrepreneurs including women, gain access to finance. IFC's record investments demonstrate the impact of the positive trends on the continent. IFC has been growing at around 5% for a decade and a half. We see even higher growth ahead, and the best performing economy is doing far better than the average. Actually, for the year 2014, you will see most uh, Economists, if I can uh, now mention probably at least the colleagues from the Bretton Woods institutions, whether the IMF or the World Bank, they see I, I Africa as a continent, and I, I talk here about Sub Saharan Africa growing at, at about 6, 6.1% for, for the year. And over the coming, I would say, probably next three to five years, they talk about an average of 5.7%. So you are still growing at more than 5%. Political and macroeconomic stability has been supported by government actions to free up markets and unleash the power of the private sector. Reducing trade barriers, cutting corporate taxes, privatizing state-owned enterprises, and strengthening legal and regulatory systems. African economies largely languished or suffered severe bombs and bursts for five decades prior to the dawn of the 21st century. Homegrown businesses couldn't thrive in poorly governed, unstable economies. Historically, Africa's domestic event, I'm sorry, domestic investment has been low. During the recent decade, though, we have seen some encouraging progress. Africa has strong and growing businesses in most important sectors and key areas for growth. IFC is supporting African companies across a range of sectors. But there are just too few quality African companies. And they are only beginning to break out of their home markets. As at IFC, we are proud of the progress we are seeing among some of our African-based clients, especially as they move into neighboring markets and take advantage of declining trade barriers. I'll give a few examples. Um, Safal, uh, it's been in steel and aluminum. And it's a company, it's in, in Kenya, but throughout East Africa and growing out of East Africa, we started working with them when it was uh, still a relatively small company. Today it's a really large conglomerate. If I mention VegPro in agribusiness, I can still remember I was in Nairobi uh, when we did um, probably about maybe five, seven years ago, our first loan to VegPro. And VegPro, they had, sales at the time of around maybe 
10, 20 million dollars. Today they have a few hundred million dollars of business. Um, and they are, when we just finance another transaction with them in Ghana. So to tell you how companies are growing out of their Africa. So Zambif in Zambia, still agribusiness. Dangote Group in Nigeria, you probably all know Dangote Group. Patison in Senegal. We have in South Africa, what a standard bank uh, in terms of to go a bit in the financial sector and others, and I'll pass. IFC's African business, I'm sorry, IFC African clients demonstrate that African companies can expand and develop rapidly in these fast growing markets, but it is not easy. Fast growing African companies need to focus on governance and building management capacity. Today, African companies need to allow themselves to increase the scale of their businesses and gain capacity to operate across markets. Africa has made strides in reducing barriers to trade and investment, and this is a contributing factor to the high growth we are seeing today. To put the issue in broader perspective, I would point out that African domestic investment historically has been among the lowest in the world. From 1990 to 2009, African domestic private investment averaged only 18% of GDP. Compared with more than 20% in all other developing regions, with East Asia the highest at 28%. Consistent high growth has increased domestic private investment in recent years, but Africa has a way to go to catch up with the rest of the developing world. And by the way, when I mention Africa, I'm sorry, but given that we cover Sub-Saharan Africa, I really make reference primarily on Sub-Saharan Africa to Sub-Saharan Africa, sorry. Nurturing the growth of Africa's domestic enterprises is critical to cope with the uncertain role of foreign direct investment. Despite high growth, African companies as a whole are failing to fully capitalize on the African boom. Turnover for Africa's top 500 companies rose only 3.5% in 2012, despite about 5% economic growth in the region. Africa is counting on its domestic private sector to create jobs. Africa has the fastest growing population in the world. Indeed, all the experts uh, predict, or oh, it seems to be obvious at the, at the rate of growth, that it will double by 2050. And what's very interesting is that by 2050, it will be the most populous continent. And frankly, also in terms of young population, ability to work, that's going to be a huge dividend for Africa because we'll have the growers uh, part uh, and the largest part of youth available to work that we should hopefully be able uh, to take advantage on. These young people will need jobs. We know the level of unemployment in Africa. Formal wage employment accounts for only 16% of the labor force. The region also faces biggest needs in job growth with an estimated 10 million entering into the labor force per year. Job creation is a question that concerns every leader and whether these many young people find jobs affects global security and well-being. And we all know that. I mean, we have seen turmoil that has happened in a number of countries in the region. And we know a big chunk, a big part of it is because, frankly, we don't have enough jobs for our young people. Um, jobs are the most important pathway out of poverty and are key for shared prosperity. In sub-Saharan Africa, Unlike any other region, small enterprises under 20 employees account for most of the formal jobs. And together, SMEs account for about three quarters of formal employment. And that does not even count the very large informal sector, which consists almost exclusively of micro and small businesses. If we want to see an acceleration of job growth throughout Africa, Hundreds, even thousands, of successful microenterprises and small businesses must become large companies. Through the extensive value chains, larger companies can create a large multiple of indirect jobs for each direct job they create. IFC client Safal, for example, is responsible for an estimated 24,000 jobs in its distribution network, compared with only 4,200 jobs that they have directly into the company a ratio of over 5 to 1. In sub-Saharan Africa, productivity in large versus small firms is more than five times higher. Wages are almost three times higher, and they are almost three times as likely to offer training. 
64% of large firms do, do versus 24%, 23% of small firms. The many examples of African success stories among our clients indicate that African companies can succeed and take a leadership role in many sectors. African companies urgently need domestic large companies to develop and grow if we want to improve living conditions and bring hope to the hundreds of millions of young Africans entering the workforce in the decades ahead. I look forward to the discussion ahead about large African companies. This is a very rich topic at the heart of Africa's future development. And we have a great panel here to discuss these issues today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jean-Philippe. As I mentioned um, at the beginning, uh, Jean-Philippe has to leave us now for some other meetings. But I do believe, as I look at the clock, we have five more minutes of your time, and, and hopefully that can uh, manifest itself in two questions. So whoever would like to ask a question, we have uh, a microphone over there, specific to the points in relation to the um, uh, intervention that uh, Jean-Philippe has just made. Any takers on the questions? Euh, merci pour mon invitation et merci, Monsieur le Président. Euh, vous avez évoqué la question de l'emploi des jeunes. Vous avez évoqué également les paiements. Mais nous, ce que nous voyons, ce que nous constatons, c'est que les jeunes diplômés ont la capacité d'entreprendre, mais vous leur demandez trois bilans financiers. Un jeune qui vient de démarrer, vous lui demandez trois bilans financiers avant qu'il n'accède au financement, ça pose problème. Les PME également. Les PME n'accèdent pas au financement parce qu'elles n'ont pas de garantie. Chez nous, au Sénégal, l'État a mis en place un fonds de garantie appelé Fonds GIP. Mais le Fonds GIP garantit à 70%. Et les PME n'ont pas les 30% qui restent. Donc, comment les PME, dans ce cas, peuvent accéder au crédit vous avez dit également, dans l'agroalimentaire, vous avez financé au Sénégal une société. Mais cette société-là, c'est une très grande société, parce que c'est à coût de milliards. Donc, comment les PME peuvent accéder au financement de la SFI Je me présente, je m'appelle Mme Diaw Fatou, je suis la présidente de l'Organisation des femmes d'affaires africaines. Je suis consultant en développement et j'ai mis en place un certain nombre de projets dans la valorisation if we could keep the question agricole, brief, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, écoutez, Milma, well, I, I guess, uh, I'm sorry, I will just answer in English, but for, for the majority of people who are here, I guess, no? Uh, Robert will be better, right? No, no that's fine. As, how do you feel comfortable? <laughs> no, no, but that, 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 that's fine. I'll do that. Um, well, first, Great questions, but I, let me try to first by saying, as you are addressing IFC, um, unfortunately, we won't be able, as an institution, to solve all problems. But, however, I think we can address the points that you mentioned. When you mentioned for, for the youth, you mentioned um, the banks ask them for three, you know, balance sheet or whatever. This is, that's the way most commercial banks will work indeed. And what you will have, you will need some special institutions. And as you mentioned, there is that guarantee fund to help support uh, you know, the youth. One other area that's going to be very helpful is when you start having an area where we are working as IFC on building the credit infrastructure, for example, credit bureaus. So if you look in the US, um, and I'm not, not referring to the youth in particular, but I think in general. Many people can have access to a credit card in 24 hours. You can do it by phone. Or even a mortgage, you can very, very quickly. Why? It's because they are the, what they call the credit bureau. The information is available. How many times you have defaulted in the past and things like that. So that helps increase the volume, access to credit, and particular consumer finance in most economies. And this is some of the infrastructure that we are trying, that we are building as IFC. But, but to go more directly on your question when you say that we don't, um, 
You take Partisan. By the way, Partisan is not the only company that we have financed. But we take it as an example, that, as I was mentioning, because they are growing outside of, Dakar, outside of Senegal. And we're talking about large African firms. So we consider them as part of large African firms. Now, having said that, to, to finance small companies, and I would say small and medium companies, we cannot finance them directly because they are too small for what we can do because basically it would be too expensive and we would lose our shirt because we cannot um, do it from whether even if we're in Dakar to follow very closely some of the companies we, we give 15000 you would give $50,000 to because basically we cannot see their movement of funds where the money is going all the time. Commercial banks can do that. However, part of the problem the commercial banks quite often, they don't necessarily know how to work with SMEs and they want a lot of collateral. So what we do as IFC, we have a program that we call Africa MSME, micro, small, and medium enterprises, where we work with local bank, retrain them, we help them work with SMEs. Sometimes we have people going there for two or three years, staying, working with the institution, reviewing the whole uh, small and medium enterprise department. So help them build that capacity, and we also provide technical assistance to the small and medium enterprise themselves, making them better borrowers, being able to prepare a good business plan, to manage their cash flow better, so they can have that dialogue with bankers. And, and this is how we do. So we will provide that support to build an institution, to help the institution work with micro and small, and we will work with the micro and small themselves to be able to be better borrowers. And we lend money to those institutions after that. And we have plenty of examples in sub-Saharan Africa where we have done that. And we'll be happy to give you more information after that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I have to run. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we got yeah, okay. So we're going to move on with the program now. We're going to have a, a, a panel discussion where I'm going to draw on the expertise and the experience of my distinguished uh, colleagues here from the uh, uh, development finance world, um, also from the regulatory institutions like OHADA, as well as a number of ministers responsible for coming up with the innovations that hopefully can help create these larger, um, more sustainable, more pan-African uh, companies. Um, there was a recent interview that uh, Warren Buffett gave, and he was basically critiquing the investment capacity of the industry going forward. He said that the industry lacks the one fundamental skill to be successful investors going forward. Uh, no one really came up with the answer to what that one um, element is, and his view was that it's called imagination. It is the ability to conceive an investment opportunity 15 to 25 years down the line, and we're all very locked into a quarter to quarter or a, a much shorter cycle. So I'm now going to call on Minister Tarr to get your view, um, to tap your imagination about the vision that you have um, for creating um, larger companies in Mauritania and, and sort of leveraging um, the, the natural resource endowments and, and, and your strategic views on how to, on how to grow companies. I will speak in French. Donc, merci donc pour cette question. Effectivement, euh, l'imagination constitue euh, un élément fondamental pour le développement du secteur privé. Nous rappelons tous de, de l'exemple de l'entrepreneur choupeterien. Donc, euh, en Mauritanie, euh, nous sommes actuellement dans une phase de développement euh, du secteur privé qui est encore une phase très préliminaire. Comme vous le savez, l'Afrique a connu des décennies de marasme économique. Et ce n'est qu'au cours de la dernière décade qu'une qu croissance forte a été enregistrée. Et c'est ce qui crée actuellement le besoin de développer de larges entreprises privées. En Mauritanie, nous venons juste tout juste d'avoir de, 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 notre première stratégie de développement du secteur privé qui, qui sera adoptée incessamment. Et cette stratégie est basée sur un diagnostic des points faibles et des points forts du secteur privé dans notre pays. Et la vision que nous avons donc de, de, du développement du secteur privé est qu'on ne peut imaginer un développement du secteur privé sans une intégration régionale. 
c'est le premier paramètre. Deuxièmement, euh, cette, euh, ce développement du secteur privé doit prendre en considération les potentialités euh, de nos pays, et en particulier le développement de nos ressources naturelles. Euh, troisièmement, euh, cette approche doit être axée aussi sur le développement des compétences locales et euh, éventuellement euh, l'appui de la diaspora euh, qui devrait contribuer euh, à travers euh, donc, euh, des compétences avérées euh, au développement donc, de, du secteur privé. Pour être un peu plus pratique, euh, je parlerai de deux secteurs euh, qui, je considère, aujourd'hui sont des secteurs... Euh, déterminant dans le développement du secteur privé dans nos pays et surtout par rapport à la dynamique de croissance que connaissent les pays africains actuellement. Donc le premier secteur, c'est le secteur des BTP, donc des travaux publics, et le second secteur, le secteur des, des mines. Par rapport au secteur des BTP, aujourd'hui, la plupart des pays africains euh, connaissent des déficits importants d'infrastructures qu'ils cherchent à combler. Et pour combler ces, ces déficits, il va falloir réaliser un certain nombre d'infrastructures portières, aéroportières, routières, ferroviaires, et j'en passe. Le problème qui se pose aujourd'hui euh, aux pays africains, c'est que pour réaliser de tels projets, le tissu entrepreneurial local est incapable de, de répondre à, aux besoins. Et la plupart des entreprises de PTP dans nos pays, c'est des entreprises de petite taille, si ce n'est des, des entreprises qui sont à la limite de l'informalité, qui n'ont ni les capacités techniques, ni le matériel nécessaire, ni les ressources humaines compétentes capables de mener des projets de ce type, et moins encore les ressources financières qui leur permettent donc de supporter un cycle d'exploitation assez long, comme c'est le cas pour les cycles d'exploitation des de BTP. Qu'est-ce qui se passe donc Nous avons donc des entreprises chinoises, des entreprises parfois européennes qui, qui viennent donc réaliser ces travaux dans, dans nos pays. Et c'est là un besoin extrêmement important pour les pays africains d'avoir des entreprises endogènes qui pourraient avoir des avantages compétitifs par rapport aux entreprises chinoises et par rapport aux entreprises européennes sur trois domaines en particulier. D'abord, les coûts de mobilisation. Donc une entreprise déjà sur le sol africain a moins de coûts de mobilisation à supporter qu'une entreprise euh, qui viendrait donc de, de Chine ou qui viendrait de, de, du continent européen. Donc les coûts de mobilisation et de démobilisation seraient beaucoup moins, moins importants. Deuxièmement, l'autre le, le, facteur qui militent en faveur des entreprises africaines et qui leur donnent un avantage comparatif par rapport aux autres entreprises, c'est la question de, de, du risque, la perception du risque. Donc une entreprise qui vient travailler en Afrique, elle a toujours une perception du risque qui fait que dans ses coûts, elle intègre une prime de risque assez élevée pour tenir compte d'un environnement qu'elle ne connaît pas, d'aléas qu'elle juge certainement à partir d'une perception euh, liée à l'image que les médias font euh, véhiculée de l'Afrique. Une entreprise africaine, par contre, a une vision, une très bonne connaissance des terrains et pourrait donc euh, euh, avoir des, des, une prime de risque beaucoup moins importante dans ses calculs euh, donc de, de coûts. Le troisième élément important aussi, c'est la connaissance du milieu et qui leur permet aussi de, de, de régler beaucoup de problèmes de mise en œuvre et des problèmes de fonctionnement au quotidien euh, qu'une entreprise venant de l'extérieur ne pourrait pas euh, avoir. C'est pourquoi je, 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 je milite et, et nous considérons en Mauritanie qu'il qu est, qu est grand temps pour les entreprises, pour l'émergence d'entreprises africaines de grande taille dans le domaine des, des bâtiments et travaux publics pour répondre à, aux besoins du marché et pour euh, permettre aux, aux pays africains de pouvoir donc euh, réaliser leurs projets d'infrastructure dans de très bonnes conditions et à des coûts euh, relativement bas, en tout cas beaucoup plus bas que les coûts 
que ces pays auraient à supporter si ces travaux étaient réalisés par des entreprises étrangères. Dans le domaine des ressources naturelles, nous avons une expérience en Mauritanie, c'est la Société nationale industrielle et minière. À un certain moment, l'un des gouvernements mauritaniens avait pensé à vendre cette entreprise. Et heureusement que cette transaction n'a pas eu lieu parce qu'avec la crise donc de, 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 de 2008-2009, nous avons vu à quel point les entreprises... Donc, les, les, les entreprises minières étrangères qui opéraient sur le sol africain euh, avaient tendance donc, à adopter des stratégies euh, qui visaient à réduire donc, les, les risques euh, auxquels ils étaient confrontés en, en fermant certaines mines, les mines qui étaient les moins rentables. Et, et si cette entreprise nationale avait été vendue auparavant, elle aurait été euh, fermée par le... le, le, le l'entreprise internationale qui l'aurait acquise, étant donné qu que sa rentabilité était moins importante que celle d'autres mines dans d'autres pays. Cet exemple nous a fait réellement euh, prendre conscience euh, de l'importance aussi de, que le secteur de ressources naturelles soit géré par des entreprises africaines euh, ou du moins euh, tiers-mondistes qui euh, ne regarderait pas, donc, dans le cadre d'une stratégie de groupe au niveau global, euh, la question de, de la rentabilité relative euh, de l'entreprise. Et donc, euh, cette entreprise a pu continuer à fonctionner avec une rentabilité qui était moindre et elle est, est aujourd'hui en train de, de réaliser des bénéfices importants euh, avec le, le renversement de, de, de la tendance. Alors que si elle avait été sous le contrôle d'une entreprise étrangère, elle aurait certainement été fermée et avec tous les dégâts que cela aurait causé en termes de, de licenciement euh, du personnel et aussi des effets sur, sur le secteur et sur l'économie nationale tout entière. Nous, nous avons d'autres exemples, l'exemple d'entreprises étrangères opérant par exemple dans le secteur de, de l'or qui avaient des programmes d'expansion et avec la chute des prix de l'or, ces programmes ont été arrêtés avec des licenciements qui, qui ont été faits. Donc, cela montre tout l'intérêt d'avoir des entreprises africaines euh, qui géreraient des ressources naturelles euh, et qui prendraient en considération donc, la rentabilité relative et les aspects sociaux euh, que d'autres entreprises qui ont des stratégies de groupe au niveau mondial ne prendraient pas en considération. Je ne voudrais pas être très long, je m'arrêterai à ces deux exemples. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I'd just like to come back on one example uh, where we're often um, referred to the fact that we don't have the capacity within the companies to take on, um, you know, the responsibility uh, for some major industries. And I understand that you have um, a very good um, point of view on your rail industry, for example, in Mauritania, if you could share that with us. Effectivement, euh, au niveau de, de notre entreprise nationale industrielle et minière, nous avons une expérience euh, de chemin de fer qui est gérée entièrement par euh, des compétences nationales depuis plus de cinq décennies et dans des conditions naturelles extrêmement difficiles, dans les, en plein désert, avec des vents de sable très forts. Et cette, euh, nous pensons que cette expérience pourrait être partagée avec les autres pays africains dans le cadre d'une grande entreprise de, de chemin de fer à, africaine. Et en tout cas, nous sommes très ouverts pour tout partenariat dans ce cadre. Thank you. Well, that's an idea. Um, if I can now move on to Minister Sisse, who, who has a regional mandate. We've heard from uh, Jean-Philippe Prosper and, and Minister Tan now about the regional market. I think we have a very clear understanding that uh, 12% uh, intra-regional trade um, is very low, although someone reminded me the other day that means 88% of opportunity. So I think, but we need a strategy that underlines how to take companies from across the continent to underpin their growth, to access um, and profit from some of these opportunities. So I'm going to call on you now, Minister Cisse, to just share some of your views since you have a regional uh, mandate. Um, how do we assist um, smaller African companies become larger on the back of their ability to access um, and, and, and trade more efficiently on a, on a regional basis. 
Bien, merci bien. Oui, je voudrais d'abord effectivement confirmer que je suis tout à fait d'accord avec mon collègue Sidi quant à la nécessité de, de renforcer d'abord nos politiques d'industrialisation. Il est d'abord indiscutable qu'il ne peut pas... Euh, nous ne pouvons pas avoir d'opportunité de créer des entreprises très larges si nous n'avons pas une politique d'industrialisation très large et de transformation donc, de, nos, de nos économies. Euh, le deuxième point, effectivement, sur lequel je pense qu'il est important d'agir, c'est que nous ne pouvons pas avoir des entreprises larges si nous restons dans une perspective uniquement nationale. Les, les tailles de nos marchés sont, sont trop faibles pour permettre effectivement le développement euh, large de, de capacités euh, industrielles. Et euh, ceci donc suppose véritablement que les partenariats puissent se faire au sein d'un groupe, euh, groupe assez important. Je peux imaginer par exemple la CDAO au niveau de l'Afrique de l'Ouest ou l'UMOA qui peuvent donner à ce moment des tailles de marché et des capacités de mobilisation de, de, de ressources humaines suffisantes pour effectivement envisager un développement important. Au niveau de, des aspects sectoriels, je crois qu'il est aussi possible d'envisager de, cette industrialisation si on on examine la possibilité de développer plutôt l'agriculture. Je crois que c'est un des points les plus importants sur lesquels aujourd'hui l'Afrique peut avoir un avantage comparatif important pour euh, permettre de développer cette industrialisation. D'abord parce que euh, la capacité de mettre en œuvre euh, euh, des forces de travail est plus importante et euh, c'est véritablement ce qui permettrait de renforcer les, la croissance économique puisque la volatilité de nos taux de croissance est généralement liée au fait que le secteur agricole n'est pas maîtrisé, n'est pas transformé et sur ce plan-là, je crois qu'il y a véritablement un axe sur lequel les institutions comme la SFI, les institutions multilatérales en tout cas, peuvent euh, aider nos pays en mettant en place vraiment des programmes d'action importants qui permettent véritablement d'avoir de, euh, euh, des actions d'envergure au niveau de, de l'industrialisation agricole. Euh, en ce qui concerne particulièrement euh, le Niger, euh, au-delà de, de l'agriculture qui peut être euh, un aspect extrêmement important, il y a surtout euh, le domaine minier pour lequel il y a une expérience très grande. Près de 60 ans, nous avons eu des unités minières d'uranium. Et aujourd'hui, le Niger a pu finalement gérer ces unités minières avec pratiquement 99% du personnel au niveau national. Donc sur 100 cadres que nous avons pour l'exploitation des mines d'uranium au Niger, seulement un seul expatrié. Alors donc, je crois que c'est aussi une démonstration que les partenariats, euh, il n'est pas indispensable de penser qu'il faille euh, tout de suite euh, imaginer que l'ensemble des structures euh, et les entreprises peuvent se développer de manière endogène euh, à partir donc simplement d'une euh, politique euh, d'incitation. Mais je pense que je crois beaucoup aux partenariats euh, avec aussi euh, des partenaires extérieurs. Et c'est le cas, euh, par exemple, en tout cas, que nous pouvons dire où nous avons eu des résultats assez probants euh, en ce qui concerne euh, le domaine minier, qui est pris en charge maintenant euh, par le Niger euh, après euh, beaucoup d'efforts de, beaucoup qui ont été faits de, de nigérisation. Mais euh, les ressources qui euh, ont permis, en particulier la mobilisation des ressources financières, a permis quand même de maintenir cette, ces activités de façon importante. Donc je pense que, pour me résumer, nous avons un effort à faire 
pour l'industrialisation d'une manière générale. Nous avons un effort à faire pour euh, industrialiser euh, l'agriculture. Nous avons un effort à faire également pour permettre de, de trouver euh, les canaux qui permettent à nos structures euh, euh, nationales de travailler avec des structures internationales pour euh, donc organiser euh, ces entreprises qui, à ce moment-là, devraient avoir euh, une taille qui permettrait de couvrir le, un marché plus large euh, dans la mesure où les structures euh, régionales euh, permettent aussi de créer les conditions euh, d'intégration euh, qui donc offriront donc, euh, ces marchés à ces entreprises naissantes. Voilà ce que je pourrais dire en ce qui concerne euh, la vision du Niger. Merci. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister Sisse. I, I chaired a panel last week at the um, EU-Africa Heads of State Summit, and on my panel I had um, President Mahama from Ghana. And one interesting point that he made is that he's come to the realization that when we talk about a, a pan-African opportunity and we talk about regional integration, he's realized that the incentives that were typically given to international companies, which are fair and fine, those same incentives or incentives of a similar nature are not extended to domestic companies. And he actually felt that that was some form of omission, um, that at least one should create a level, a level, a level a playing field. Uh, Minister, is this a view that you share? I'm coming back to you, uh, Minister Cissé, on, on this point. Um, are there very specific level playing field type approaches that we should be thinking about for our domestic private sector? Je pense qu'il y a effectivement un problème de fiscalité à voir, mais je, je, je ne crois pas qu'il s'agit d'un problème, en tout cas dans le cas particulier de Niger, d'une discrimination euh, négative euh, au niveau des, des structures nationales, mais plutôt de taille et d'importance euh, stratégique des secteurs. Et c'est pour cela que je crois qu'il est important, euh, comme je l'ai souligné tout à l'heure, pour des secteurs qui sont profondément important, par exemple au niveau de l'énergie, au niveau de, 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 des mines, de faire en sorte que des partenariats puissent se faire dans des conditions beaucoup plus équilibrées euh, que cela ne se fait aujourd'hui, puisque nous avons euh, dans la plupart du cas des, des filiales de grandes, euh, de, de, de grandes entités multinationales qui interviennent pour l'exploitation des mines. Il faut faire une avancée plus forte pour que le secteur privé local puisse effectivement être aussi un partenaire beaucoup plus important. Je prends par exemple le domaine minier au Niger où de plus en plus nous essayons donc de réduire le poids du partenariat extérieur au bout d'une certaine, certaine période d'exploitation, dans le cas des mines d'uranium par exemple, pour augmenter non seulement la part publique nigérienne, mais aussi la part euh, privée nationale. Donc c'est beaucoup plus une question de taille, de, de marché que euh, véritablement. Mais c'est un élément euh, important dans lequel on peut... Le code d'investissement d'une manière générale, euh, avec l'amélioration que nous faisons de, euh, des conditions d'accessibilité de, au, au, du secteur privé permet aussi à des entreprises euh, nationales d'avoir un certain nombre de, euh, de bénéfices et d'exonérations qui, qui sont aussi euh, euh, attribués dans les mêmes conditions. Et évidemment, le point est que les tailles de ces entreprises et leur capacité, surtout leur accès au, au système bancaire et à la capacité d'avoir des structures bancaires euh, qui puissent les appuyer, parce que cet élément également est un élément très important. Il ne s'agit pas simplement d'avoir euh, l'accès aux, aux industries, mais il faut également que le, le secteur bancaire puisse suivre et donner aussi l'appui nécessaire. Et c'est généralement ce qui manque dans, dans les structures africaines euh, qui sont donc euh, euh, déployées dans le secteur privé. Voilà. Thank you, Minister. Well, I think we have to move to the banker that we have on the panel then um, to share some insights. And, and Admasa, we'd just like to hear from you just a little bit about the practicalities from a policy level 
that would make your life easier financing these companies that actually want to operate, trade, and invest um, across the continent, uh, initially sub-regionally, then pan-continentally? Um, please share your views. Uh, thank you, Hubert. Um, maybe just a quick introduction. For those of you who don't know, PTA Bank is an enterprise financing focused bank. In addition to being a trade finance bank, we work across 18 countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. And uh, we've had actually a great deal of growth over the past few years, 30% per annum, almost running for five years, which shows that actually even though their history has been weak in terms of growth of African enterprises, this past five years has been very strong in our region. So that's the good news, and I can maybe give you a sense of the flavor of that. I think the question of what can be done to help larger African corporates move across borders. I mean, just generally speaking, when you look at large African enterprises, they, they don't have the same level of constraint as small enterprises have. They can access bank finance quite easily. The issue for our big African enterprises is cost of funding. And when they move across borders, oftentimes they set up subsidiaries across borders, and then they need risk capital because even though they're strong enough where they are, their home bases, if you like, when they start extending across borders, they find that their, their risk capital position gets strained. And so there's a, whole, there's a question of, of capital, access to specialized forms of finance for those kinds of entities. On the policy side, I think one, you know, there's a general issue around the environment of doing business in terms of contract enforcement, the whole question of the confidence levels that African enterprises have to invest across the board. And it's, it, I wouldn't say it's specific to moving across borders. It's just generally in terms of you know, the environment of doing business on the institutional side, whether it means getting licenses or, or, or having confidence to, to go into countries where there isn't track record of getting quick judgments, fair judgments, courts are not well capacitated. You have a situation where you know, there's been a lot of negative reports about what happens when you get into trouble, whether you're an African enterprise or any other enterprise, it's the same issue. So I think, I think there's a general issue of the institutional framework around doing business, and, and it applies to cross-border enterprises in addition to, to other enterprises. But I think, I think there's very good reason to to at least acknowledge the very good progress that's been seen in recent years. I mean, our, our, our phenomenal growth in recent years has been on the back of very successful African enterprises in the hotel industry, in the telecoms industry, in uh, property, trading companies, agribusiness companies, cement companies. And what's the secret of your success? Uh, well, you, we, we are selling. It's being class recorded, B by shares, the way. We'll have a few uh, more banks opening up in a minute. Uh, well, here, but we are selling Class B shares. So if you want a piece of our success, you'll have to buy into the bank. <laughs> and I have my former colleague, Dr. Gondwe, there, who also has an idea of the secrets of our success. So maybe between the two of us, we can share some of that with you. There is uh, also, of course, um, a deeper issue here in terms of what uh, needs to be done to support smaller enterprises, because the truth is, yes, we, we need bigger enterprises to drive the bigger growth figures in the continent, but really most, most, most African entrepreneurs are on the small side. We heard the lady earlier on talking about access to finance. It's a very, very difficult issue in every country. You look at the surveys on the environment of business, access to finance is the top issue for most African uh, companies. Um, and, and I think here, sometimes the the tendency is to always focus on banks and look at banks as being perhaps the source of the solution. Oftentimes, actually, what you're looking for is, 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 is venture capitalists, angel investors, a different type of, of, of financial institution that is actually structured to do that kind of, uh, of, of financing, if you like. I think, again, here, the good news is we've seen an explosion uh, in, 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 in new equity funds dedicated to Africa, uh, and, and that's been very welcome. Of course, most of this has been focused in infrastructure, a little bit in agribusiness. When you get to the SME space, I think there's only two that I know. So we need to see more risk capital being made available for SMEs. I mean, we also, like many banks, uh, raise our money on capital markets. We're not a risk capital fund. We have um, funders who fund us who have specific requirements around what we do and how we do our own business. So 
you know, banks are not just pots of money who can do what they need to do based on need. So I think there's, there, there's a bigger discussion around you know, strengthening the financial sector, getting capital markets to work, and getting special purpose vehicles to work better. I think the other good news is project finance companies or project enterprises are really moving very nicely. We're seeing a, a lot of uh, PPPs emerge in the region. These are large companies. On the face of it, it's not a, a, a classical expansion across borders. But if you look at the share, the share composition of some of these PPPs, you know, you have major African companies coming from large economies like Kenya, like South Africa, that are uh, investing across borders through SPVs, taking on board local partners. And I think that has also uh, been quite promising, and I think we're, we're bound to see more of that. Just in terms of the question of, you know, intra-regional trade, even though 12%, as you mentioned, is quite low, just to give the House of, uh, you know, a flavor of some good progress in the Comesa region, we've seen an increase of intra-trade, intra-regional trade, jump from $3 billion in in, in, at the turn of the millennium to $20 billion in 2012. That's a seven-fold increase on intra-Comesa trade. So even though the levels are low, the truth is there's a lot of informality there too. So if you were to adjust the informal trade that goes across borders, you're probably looking at 16, 18, maybe some even say 20% still a far shot off what we see in the more developed economies. 20, 30, 40% is, is actually quite common for other developing regions. So we do have work to do, but I think the Africa rising narrative is reflecting in the growth of African enterprises, and we've been profiting from that quite nicely. Thank you. Uh, class B shares. <laughs> But I want to stay with you, um, at, at Marshall, because you, you're investing directly in these companies. Uh, you know the majors. You know the, the Dan Gottis who are going continent-wide, uh, the Sassols, the MTNs. Uh, what can we learn from that? I mean, you know, talk to an entrepreneur. I want to grow to be a company of that magnitude. What, how can you help? What, what needs to be put in place on a practical level, in, in your view? Well, you know, I, I think the truth of, of business is it's a lot of the systemic issues are the issues that really create the constraints around all kinds of enterprises. I think really the sea change that we are seeing now is you have a different type of business leader emerging in the continent. We have African entrepreneurs that now see the opportunity in the continent. And, 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 and you, you, you know, the massive growth that we've been seeing the transformation. Everybody talks about this amazing growth in Africa. A lot of it is on paper, but there's a lot more that's not on paper, that's informal. And I think what we just are seeing is we're seeing Africa reap the dividends of the very important reforms that were done in the 80s and 90s, in particular the 90s. And, and there's been a huge opening up. And it's not just traditional commodity sectors, as many people know. Retail, you go to any African city, there's so many people selling all sorts of things, not just on the streets, but small kiosks, massive retail development, but you also have big shopping centers popping up all over. And, and so I, I, I think we have a new quality of African business leaders. We have entrepreneurs coming in. Uh, a lot of that is diaspora, but not the classical diaspora. You have people moving across African borders. You have Kenyan entrepreneurs, Zimbabwean entrepreneurs, Mauritian entrepreneurs moving across borders. The award-winning project we did in sugar last year, Kwale Sugar in Kenya, was Mauritian entrepreneurs coming in with their great understanding of how sugar plantations work and applying that in the Kenyan environment. You have a lot of Zimbabweans who are doing that in South Africa. You have a lot of Kenyans doing that in Tanzania and Uganda. So there, there's, a, there's also a very interesting story of cross-border entrepreneurship that's taking place like we've never seen before. So I, I, I think the, the whole question of the institutional framework for doing business mm -hmm. is where we should all focus. Fantastic. Because it really, it's almost as close as you can get to a silver bullet, and it helps everybody. Superb. And, and just, uh, this is really more of a broader question um, following on from that point. These new entrepreneurs, to what extent are they being harnessed into the conversation? Um, because we, we tend to focus on the, the sort of usual suspects, the same names. But what you're saying is there's a, an underlying, a more vibrant new crop of, of entrepreneurs and business leaders that probably afford just as much um, interest and attention 
than the majors who, in some respects, have already made it? Well, again, to be frank, I think our experience has been more with corporate entrepreneurs, African corporates behaving as entrepreneurs, both at home and across borders. I mean, just in the past 18 months, we funded one company. It's an industrial-sized company from Africa that's, you know, in, in 18 months, rolled across four countries, opened up SPVs, and gone into serious long-term businesses in four countries. And, we, and, and, and we've built up their confidence. We've told them. You know, if, 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 you, if you do as good a job as you're doing in your home country, you can count on us. We'll work with you. We'll follow you into all your markets. And they've appointed us as, as arrangers and as financiers for all of their subsidiaries. They're doing them on joint venture basis. It's, and it's, it's about confidence building and also, you know, relationships. When you, when you really start doing this kind of financing, people want committed partners. They want institutions that are going to also give you good turnaround. And with all due respect, one of the advantages we have is as an African DFI that's well-governed, well-managed, we, we, we have quick turnarounds. You don't have so many loops of decision-making that extend feedback to 9 to 12 months. We can turn around with decisions in 3 to 4 months. And that's the benefit of being based in the region. A lot of African entrepreneurs say, time is money. We can get cheaper money from Europe or even here from some of the big institutions without spe giving specific names, but they say it takes two years to get the money. That's expensive for us. The opportunity's gone, let alone the margins. So they, you know, there, there's a whole question also of, 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 of trying to keep up with the speed of African entrepreneurs. And that's as important as the cost of money. No, absolutely. I mean, expediency is uh, obviously key. Uh, opportunity waits on, on no man or, or woman. And, but, but I think you've, you've mentioned some key points about You've got to take a long-term view. And then we're seeing in the continent a, a great number of sovereign wealth funds trying to sort of capture the, the natural resource opportunities and, and project them um, to, to, to sort of spur and stimulate um, you know, economic growth and cross-border trade uh, and investment. So I'm going to ask uh, Villa now, who's, who's got that point of reference, I hope, coming from a country that, that, that has really know, known how to sort of harness its natural resources. I mean, I know that you speak more from the development side, and we'd be keen to hear how you've sort of um, taken that into the energy sector and some of the projects that you've done um, in Africa. But you know, just please share with us some, some of your reflections, because we're really going into this sovereign wealth fund um, space. I, I heard just recently that um, there were some conversations taking place with sovereign wealth funds in Africa and pension funds in Africa. And the conversation to the pension funds in Africa is there's all this infrastructure opportunity. Can we have a grant? Not can we invest? And I think it's very important that we begin to understand the psychology of, of the mandates of these institutions. But as they, uh, as they evolve, if we're talking about infrastructure investment, then the investment policy within these institutions should talk about that same asset class. Um, so it would be interesting to get some of your experience from the, just more broadly about how Norway approached this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I might also add that I've spent 20 years in the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy. So <laughs> I've been dealing with some of these issues on a daily basis before I joined NORAD. But uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to share with you some, what should I say, maybe highlights of, of Norwegian experience in this regard. And um, if we go back to the 1890s, Norway was one of the very poorest countries in Europe. Uh, people were migrating to America because of starvation. Uh, it was uh, fisheries, it was agriculture, and that was about it. Then uh, came along hydropower. Uh, did it come by itself? No, it actually came with some Norwegian professors in good combination with uh, foreign capital, French and English. And uh, that adventure started in the fjords of Norway, where it actually started with the industrialization in the most remote parts of Norway. It took uh, many decades before they had electricity in the capital from hydropower, but we were uh, starting exporting aluminum, etc. So that is an interesting as aspect. Uh, I think one of the uh, experiences from Norway is that from the very outset, we had no other alternative than to focus on the areas where we had a comparative advantage. And that was our natural resource base. And in that, I think, is many f uh, similarities with many African countries. So how do you go about 
to make the most of it, out of it. Uh, actually, in 1909, Norway uh, launched what was called the concession uh, legislation for hydropower. And that stated that the resources were vested in the state and belonged to the people. And that has been with us since that very time. Hasn't meant that we have not uh, allowed in foreign capital. Hasn't meant that we haven't formed joint ventures. We have. Uh, and I think it also was the basis for what even today is a characteristic of the Norwegian economy, namely that it is a mixed economy. That meaning we have private investors together with state-owned companies investing in the same field. Then came the petroleum area, uh, found uh, petroleum in 1969. Uh, I had a letter from Philip, a copy of a letter from Philips Petroleum uh, from that time, saying that they would generously enough uh, offer Norway to do all the exploration on the Norwegian continental shelf on behalf of the Norwegian government. Fortunately, we said no thank you. Uh, and again, it was the same sort of thinking as was uh, relevant in 1909, namely that the petroleum, at this time we didn't think we would find any much more petroleum, was vested in the state, namely the people, and it, the benefits should belong to the people. Uh, okay, we found all, everything else is a history, but there are key lessons. One is, of course, have a strategy for how do you want as a government to be involved.